This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. What's up, Mr. Brake? Man, it is a uh, scorcher here up in the Seattle area. I mean, uh, I don't know how most, most people do, but uh, the rest of the country, we don't have air conditioning up here in our houses for the majority of us folks. And it is about uh, 95 degrees, and I would say probably about 83, 84 in our house, which is um, about uh, 30 degrees C for uh, for those of you who are using the metric system, Celsius. Um I miss Austin where, you know, it's 75 degrees in your house year round if you want it to be. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So usually people set it to 68 in the summer and 80 in the winter, which I don't get. Oh God, I don't do but, that. Yeah. Whatever. Jeez. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, uh, I can tell you what temperature is in my house by whether or not my mouse hand is cold. If it is cold, it is less than 65 degrees. You can almost set me by it. I'm a human thermometer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird like that. I just have poor circulation in my hands and if it gets cold enough, I can, I can feel it and I can tell. So, well, enough about, enough about temperature and weather and such. Uh, we're here to talk about InfoSec and, um, this was, um, so we, we're, we're trying something new. Um, the, the DerbyCon talk list came out and of course I wasn't accepted because I think my talk was probably crap anyway, but I got to thinking about all those people who didn't get to to do a talk at DerbyCon. You know, those those folks, you know, 30 or 40 people you hear about whose talks were rejected. And I was like, well, what if we could get those people to come on the podcast and talk about the talk they didn't get to give? And uh, the first person to actually reach out to us was uh, the guy who we're interviewing tonight. His name is Bill. Uh, we have an update to that actually due to some issues. I don't know if he managed to, you know, you know, put some money in Dave's pocket, but his talk has now been accepted at DerbyCon. Um, but I know, right. He, he was like, Hey, you know, it's been accepted. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess it was still kind of a rejected talk. So, um, <laughs> but well, I love the, I love the subject. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, welcome, uh, Bill, to to the show. Uh, Bill has a, a last name that escapes me right now because he had two <laughs> he had two different ones, and his Twitter has something else. And so, uh, Bill, welcome to the show. Please feel free to introduce yourself, and uh, you know, maybe a little bit about your uh, your origin, your superhero story, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, my name is Bill Volks. I uh, I uh, do pretty much everything IT for a, a small to medium business here in the Midwest, in the financial uh, sector. And um, I guess a little bit about me. I uh, I went to actually went to school for InfoSec, which is probably not most people's story. Um, maybe I suppose more and more now, but um, I uh, so I, got, I went to a uh, school for InfoSec, and I I kind of learned how much I didn't know once I got out of school, and uh, but I think I learned enough to um, learn a hell of a lot once I got it into my job, pretty much doing sysadmin stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of one, one of the wake-up calls I had, though, was I went to a training that Dave Kennedy did. Um, uh, it was like for 200 bucks, and it was kind of the same thing he did at Black Hat um, that year, and uh, that really opened up my eyes and realized how much I didn't know. And uh, that mm-hmm. I would, I would, I would consider that to be kind of, you know, my awakening into the real security community, and you know, started getting involved on Twitter and and all that. Very awesome. So you said you went to college for you went to school for info. Was like was it like a degree completion program or? It was, a, uh, so, it was a computer and network security uh, bachelor's degree. Okay. Okay. Um, yep. Very cool. Very cool. So your talk, which was rejected but now has been accepted, it was on something called we're calling it. It's a pause terminal, but it's not like the the point of sale. It's P A W S. Maybe you could explain what a P A W is 
and with regard to uh, Windows environment or, or whatever. Yep, yep. So um, last or this year, um, Microsoft came out with a few articles, TechNet articles on this concept of privilege access workstation. Okay. And that's that's where it, it began as far as I know. It, maybe it was an older concept than that. I'm not totally sure. But um, they kind of had some, um, a white paper basically explaining what they are, um, how they how to deploy them in your environment. And basically what they are is um, managing your credentials, your, your, you know, like domain admin creds, member server, um, anything that's a privileged credential on a Windows environment and non-Windows too, you know, like if you had um, credentials you use for managing routers or, um, you know, any kind of, any kind of privileged credentials that you want to keep um, safe. Um, you, you deploy, um, and, and the, what, what started was they, they released a paper about how they deployed this in their own in the Microsoft environment um, where they have these um, paws that actually I think they first call them secure access workstations or saws or something but anyway it was an actual dedicated physical like uh, laptop or uh, hardware that you would check out to do to you that you, you use that for only um, administrative things like you know managing AD or your policy or whatever whatever the, the task is that you your job um, duties entail um, and then you'd have a separate machine that you would use you know for email web browsing things like that um, so it's like a separate uh, physical machine for your privileged accounts right yeah so that was kind of the that I think that as far as I know that was one of the first articles they came out with well then they came out with another um, article that talked about well it doesn't necessarily have to be two physical machines you can do you know you can have a um the the host machine be the privileged access workstation and then have a vm that you use for your productivity on that same hardware um you can uh do it with vdi you know so you'd have you'd have a privilege access workstation that's one instance uh, VM and then you'd have your productivity on a totally different VM and they'd probably be in on different network segments and VLANs and um, so there's there's more than one way to do it but but part of it was that you know jump servers and 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 that kind of a um, solution to the problem uh, they are kind of inherently flawed because you are a lot of times people would be accessing those jump servers from a machine that they also browse the web on and um, you know get their email on and not necessarily a trusted source. So if that machine is compromised, whatever they're accessing is potentially could be compromised as well. So that's kind of the the, the whole reason behind what a paw is for. Okay, and and so for for paws, uh, hearing your outline, you you mentioned that uh, that. Paws can be used to uh, limit exposure um, to things like passing the hash and stealing tickets. How does that how does that limit the exposure if you're still logging into the box? And right, right, okay. So, so if you think about um, no, and I'm not a red team guy. Mm-hmm. I have my feet barely touching the water, so um, you know this might not be 100 percent accurate. But if you think about uh, um, you know, they, an attacker gets a, a user to click a link, and they they say they, they pop that box, they get a shell on their side, and it's just a, and depending on the the security posture of that company, um, they that user may already be running as local admin, um, which make it a little bit easier um, to say they are. Um, well, running as local admin, they could then dump credentials with something like that um, of anybody that's logged in that box. So it, maybe there's a service account that um, that the the vendor said should be running as domain admin that hits every box every, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. And uh, well, now they are domain admin because they just need to, um, you know, use if they have an interpreter shell, you just 
um, do something like use incognito and um, you migrate into that process and now you're running as domain admin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, that's pretty posture it may be a little bit harder than that if if the, if the user is running as a standard user um, they would need to either elevate their privileges um, with some kind of a um, there's you know there's multiple ways to do that obviously but um, on the local machine or maybe um, uh, they, they move laterally until they find a box or there's a um, until they can get local admin dump creds and you know so on and so forth until they move up the chain and get to domain admin so the whole the whole concept of a paw is you limit those credentials to be on um machines that um they're not you're not exposing those credentials to, to as, as few places as possible possible basically Okay, so what does a what does a lab setup look like for a, a PAW terminal? I mean, uh, you said you could use it as a VM, and you know, funnily enough, I think uh, Mr. Betcher thought of uh, and myself thought of this a couple of a couple of years ago when we worked at another company uh, where uh, for PCI requirements you had to have a VM that only accessed the PCI side, and for and another VM that only accessed the non PCI side and to do work, you couldn't mix, you know, cross the beams in, in this case and pollute the mm -hmm. environment. So yeah. we had two different network connections, two different VPNs that would, you know, log into the different boxes. Is that, is that very much similar to how, how a PAW, a PAW would work in this case? Yeah. I mean, you want to keep them as separate as possible. So um, if you do, you know, for like a small, just like us, the only really way that made a whole lot of sense for us was you have a laptop that is uh, uh, the laptop is the host, and that is really your privilege access workstation. And on that, you have a, um, a, a VM. So, you know, you can use Hyper V or whatever. That would be probably the most ideal is use Hyper V, and that, that, that VM is um, your productivity machine. And with that, you can also um, put the the host on different network segment, uh, different VLAN than your VM. Um, but you the, the you don't want to have it the other way around, where you have you know your productivity machine is your host, and your um, your VM is your privilege workstation, because it's the same kind of concept as jump server, where you're not coming from a um, we're not coming from a, a trusted source or a clean source. That okay. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you mentioned deployment models on this. How how um, are there different deployment types or different deployment models on how you want to do this? Is there ways to be, um, you know, more secure? I mean, if if a, if a red team guy could pop a shell on your local box, wouldn't they have access to the, to your paw, um, your, your paw systems? Um, and you know, how, how would you limit access to the, the, your, your, your PAW system, uh, through VM? Would you use a, would you have a direct access through like, you know, like Hyper-V or would you use like RDP or VNC or something like that? Well, uh, on the pots, so, um, if somebody popped the, the the VM on the paw, I don't know that they have some kind of a way to break the to get through to the hyper you know the OS, um, which would probably be impossible. But um, it would have to be some kind of a exploit, I would think, to you know go from the guest to the host, um, which I'm sure that's possible. But um, where the one thing, though, on the on the host, you have um, a lot of it's locked down pretty tight. So, like the you know, you have different group policies, and in, in that in the, that TechNet article, they kind of go through all the different group policies. Like, you're not actually running as an admin on the PA itself, um, and any you you can't browse the web on it. You um, except for um, you know, you may have to do that. So you may have to do like a a packed file or something to allow only certain sites out. 
if you're like so if you're per if your privileged access workstation your paw is is on a vm then you're surfing the web on your physical machine right if that physical machine gets compromised then your vm is also compromised right 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 and that's why that that is not a model that you'd want to take it's kind of the same thing as as a jump server you know where you're wherever you're accessing it from if that's compromised mm -hmm. if there's a key logger on that whatever you're doing is potentially compromised too whereas if the if the the host is locked down tight you lock it down as tight as you can so that it you try to not let that ever get compromised and so it's kind so of like can, a clean source you can yeah. do google uh you know googling and all that research on the vm then you're saying your yes. vm is your standard machine and, and... yeah yep okay so the VM is the only thing that can get out to the yep. internet and the physical machine can only go to um, your, your, you know, your company's environment, your data. Yes. Right? Yes. So, um, and, and, and part of this, it, it comes down to, you know, you have got to have some prerequisites before you can just, just run, roll this out. You know, you gotta, for one thing, you gotta be breaking out, um, standard users, local user, local admins, um, member server admins, domain admins. You got to have all those different levels, and also network segmentation. So you've got user networks, admin networks. Um, you know, uh, and then you you put the paw into the admin network and the user um, productivity machine uh, in the user network. Well, um, wouldn't requiring a, a VPN kind of do the same thing, right? In order to access the trusted environment, you had to VPN into it? Um, but if you're doing that from the same machine that you are um, browsing the web and uh, opening email from, yeah. I guess it depends on your your how your how you how you authenticate to the VPN, but um, if you're still if your host gets compromised, um, anything you do from there uh, uh, could also be compromised. So right. you um on one of your on one of your bullets here you you were talking about the you were mentioning the lockdown and and separation of users that would also require you to have separate gpos for each user uh, i would yes. imagine right how yeah. how how are you deploying how are you getting the gpos uh to the host for uh various you know if i'm an admin and i need to do something i need to push an admin gpo uh, to, to be able to do the work or, um, you know, if I'm just a regular user working on the box, I would push a, the, they would push a regular GPO. I mean, how, how are you, um, handling the GPOs on the fly like that? Sure. Well, um, in the, in the TechNet article, it talks about how, um, it talks about this uh, active directory, um, administrative tier model. So like it, there's a couple PowerShell scripts they provide and, um, it, one thing it does is creates a couple levels of OUs. So you have like a tier zero, tier one, tier two. Tier zero is like your domain admin. Um, tier one would be like your member servers, admins, and 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 the boxes too, not just the users, I guess. And then tier tier two would be like your workstations and local admins uh, for administering those. And um, when you deploy the GPOs, you have the, the idea is that accounts and systems on in tier zero are never used. You don't go down to tier one or tier two. You you only um, your accounts that are in tier zero only only are accessed on or from other machines or accounts um, in tier zero. And then same with tier one and tier two. So um, that's kind of so when it when you when you run that PowerShell script, it um, sets up all those G, all those different OUs. And then when when you go to deploy this, you put 
your um, PAW users into the, you know, whatever it is, tier zero accounts, OU, you put the, the PAW computer accounts into the tier zero, um, uh, whatever the, the uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, for the machines, there's a there's OU for that. And uh, um, so it kind of, it kind of walks you through all that. I mean, and uh, the they did a really good job explaining um, and kind of walking you through running those PowerShell scripts and uh, uh, setting up the those tiers for you, I guess. So it it almost sounds like a like a fancy pseudo or something where you've got um, you, you're going to run a PowerShell script and it's going to take that host and move it to different tiers based on what you need to be done at the time. No, 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 it doesn't move them. I mean, you set up, so like you'll have a, your domain admin is always going to be in tier zero. Okay. Your member server admin is always going to be in tier one and your workstation or local admins are always going to be in tier two, mm -hmm. but you'd never, you never log on to a tier two PC with your domain admin creds. You never log okay. on to a member server with domain admin. You only log into domain controllers with domain admin. Okay. If that makes sense. So like same thing with member server admin. Um, you only log into member servers with your member server account. Um, okay. you, you never, you don't never, never log into like a PC with a member server account. Cause then you're leaving your credentials there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have, so you have a, um, you can only access certain servers with certain accounts. So you've actually taken and and split up the, the various permissions. So you're going to have four or five different accounts based on whatever tier is is going on. So if you are, yes. Yes. if you're a domain admin, and and actually you're going to, it's it's almost what is it? It's it's role based, right? So I mean, if you're a domain admin, you're going to have a domain account, a member account, uh, a super user, uh, a, you know, like an, uh, yep. Yep. Uh, and then a regular user account. And that gets, it gets a little, um, out of hand pretty quickly when you're a small, uh, small business. Like, you know, yeah. You have a couple IT people, you have a lot of accounts. Yeah. Um, and I, I would imagine depending on who's working at the, uh, at the, the organization you're working at, you know, they may have a need for, um, uh, you know, a higher level user account than just regular user. And so they all have two accounts on their own as well. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that you have to put in the, the groundwork first to like, you, you know, you, you gotta make sure users, users aren't running as a local admin first. I mean, that's kind of, mm -hmm. that's your first step. If you're, if you're not doing that, um, that's kind of the first thing you got to tackle. And, and a lot of this takes, um, a lot of uh, organization or um, a buy-in from from um, upper management, or you're, you're probably not going to get it done. Well, okay. So you said you worked for a, a relatively small organization. What was the culture change like? Because obviously they weren't doing this when you know you got there. This must have been something you've been working on in the last six months to a year. So what was the culture change or the culture shift like for this? Was this a Hey, you know, uh, there's a compliance requirement for us to do, you know, X, Y, and Z, and this will solve our problem. Or, you know, hey guys, you know, security-wise, we just need to be doing this because this will make us more secure. Uh, how how are you? How you know you got buy-in from management, but how did it, how did it work with the rest of the employees? Right. Um, it actually wasn't wasn't that hard, uh, but I'm pretty lucky. The, in the fact I have, I have a lot of control and um uh in what we're do we do for it and, mm -hmm. um, I don't, we don't have a big team and you know there's not a lot of people that are kind of stuck in their ways that i had to really talk into this and what i did what i did first was i i tested it out on myself um so i broke out you know my account my accounts into like six accounts and just worked that way for a few months and kind of worked out the bugs before I even showed anybody it. And then I went down the line showing different people. And at first they're kind of like, yeah, but why, why, why yeah. are you doing that? You know? Yeah. Because they don't, they don't understand the risk, but if you can demo them 
a Meterpreter shell um, and running Mimikatz and migrating to uh, a, an, an admin account on a box. Um, that that that's kind of that that kind of opens people's eyes, especially sysadmins that don't under that don't aren't really into security. Um, when you show them that, they're like it kind of opens up their eyes. Yeah, yeah, seeing is believing. Yeah, we we talked about that a couple of weeks ago in our Mimi Cats uh, a podcast, where it's like, you know, getting rid of the the you know if you could get rid of local admin, that makes it a lot easier to you know protect against this kind of stuff or, you know, not, you know, setting up your, your systems properly. Uh, so how was, how hard was it to get rid of local admin on there? Did you give them the ability to do everything a local admin did without actually being local admin? Or did you just say, Hey, you know what? You're not going to have local admin privileges. If you want to install software, you're going to have to come through us. How did, how did you handle that from an organizational point of view? Well, it took a while to do, get that one done. Actually, I it. Um, one of the things we had to do was invest in some kind of a software to deploy software quickly and easily. Um, and what what I ended up using is PDQ deploy. Um, it did well for us. Um, uh, and it was just kind of slowly, um, it, you know, when, when Windows 7 was um, finally up and running um, and UAC and they kind of got the bugs worked out of that after Vista and stuff. Um, it works really well if you have it set up right. And um, you know, the, the hard part though is you have some installer, some some applications that don't play nice with UAC, and maybe they're EXEs or whatever. And so you cannot run them unless you are a local admin. And that, so putting pressure on vendors to fix that kind of stuff um, that just kind of took time. But but I think. It's it's been it's there it's here now at least for us and it and it has been for a while, um, so I know I know it's not easy and uh, by no means easy but it is possible to do that for sure. What when you did the rollout was it by department or did you just do it across the the entire enterprise? Did you were you able to say okay this department needs you know, access to only certain things so we can give them only certain accounts. I mean, how, how did you, how did you roll this out? Cause it seems like even, even with a small organization, you may have what 10, 15 different roles yeah, mm -hmm. for a company with thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, this could get unwieldy pretty quickly, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, again, I kind of tested it on myself and, mm -hmm. um, and then I rolled it out. I, I, I had like a handful of users, like, um, you know, whatever your roles are, you know, so take a, take a small subset of one of one or, you know, one or two of each role. Um, you know, maybe anybody that does kind of uses different applications, you'd want to kind of have in your test group and then, you know, kind of get them on board to just try this with you and then take it away, see what breaks. And, you know, you want to be really nice to them. So if you're causing them any kind of, um, you know, that they're not able to do your job, you got to turn it off and let them, you know, until you can figure out what, you know, and make, let them do their job. You know, you don't want to be, um, you want to be nice to them, especially if you're letting you be uh, the guinea pig for you. Sure. So to do this, uh, you don't have to take away admin privileges, right? You can, you can still have admin on your guest or your PAW. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, your, you can still have admin on your regular machine, right? Your everyday machine. It's not going to affect um, your access like on the Paul, right? Right. But I still don't run that as local admin. I still run as a standard user. And if I have to elevate, if I have to install something or something, then I use uh, the next level, the next account up. Right, but it's not a requirement to get the same security. No, right. right yeah, no. Um, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily have to. Cool. Okay, and you can also do this um, with VDI, obviously, right? Yep. Doesn't yeah, if, if you already have that uh, set up in your environment, you could um, have a, 
um, uh, admin machine and a productivity machine. Um, how you access that would be a question. That would probably depend on how you have, you know, VDI set up. I don't know if it would be like a thin client or I don't know um, how that would work, but um, you would want to make sure that was coming from a trusted source, you know, like something that's really locked down, however you're accessing that privileged one. Okay, so you know it's good that you're actually you're actually uh, eating your dog food on this. So, what were yeah. some of the lessons learned that you got when you were deploying this? Well, um, I guess some of the things are like I, I didn't realize how awesome, awesome Hyper V is on Windows 10. Um, you know, I can have my uh, guest productivity machine um, running pretty. And not really even know that that's what I'm running with on my dual monitors and the audio, video, everything works really well. Um, you know, copying, pasting uh, between host and VM, and um, the Hyper-V networking is really sweet too because you can put e your VMs easily into another VLAN um, between wired and wireless. It all just works really well. Some one of the lessons learned though is that, like I said, it gets pretty. It can be get, get pretty unwieldy. Um, the number of accounts that you have to manage uh, and keep track of. And I was talking about this with a buddy of mine, and he we were just talking about how he would deploy it in his environment, and he said I I wouldn't be able to talk people into that because our our password policy is so strict we can't even have like a dictionary word in our password. And I said, well, that's stupid. If your, your minimum requirements is, you know, nine characters, but you can't have a, you know, a 25 character password that has a dictionary word in it, you know, like some, there would have to be a change there because you're not gonna be able to remember, you know, six accounts that are just totally random without a, without a single, a dictionary word in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you said that uh, the, the pod deployment uh, works well with network segmentation. Maybe you could uh, help us understand how that works. I know you said with the, you know, you can have separate network segments depending on, you know, which device, but I mean, how does that work along with, with, with network segmentation of, of, of your, your business network? Right. So, um, so let's say you have, you have um, 10 locations and and you may have to be go to any of them to um, fix whatever it is IT related. Um, so you could set up an admin network at each location and a user network at each location. And one thing that we did recently is the user networks can no longer talk to any other user networks whatsoever. You can't ping it. You can't uh, you can't hit it at all. Um, and uh, from the admin networks, obviously you have to be able to talk um, through those. But I mean, even we we even did um, VLAN ACL. So even if you were on the same user network, same local um, LAN network as another user that's on the user network, you can't you can't communicate with it. Um, and we even just recently had a pen test. And um, and it went really well because we put them on a user um, network, and they were they, all they could really see is some some of the internal servers that they need to see, but they couldn't move laterally anywhere because they couldn't talk to anything else. Um, but that just plays well because you know you have your user VM, and you put that on the user network, and then you have your admin host. And you put that on the admin network, and um, you it just that, that you want to have that user VM um, segmented um, to kind of protect your host too, I suppose, in case there there was a way to break off onto the um, hypervisor. Mm. Okay, so we were a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the Mimi Cats thing. I mentioned the protected users group. Uh, how would yeah. wouldn't wouldn't the protected users group kind of 
solve a lot of the issues with regard to, you know, um, you know, what users, what roles were in place. Yeah. Could you automate the process of saying, okay, I want to, you know, I want to change roles. Uh, I'm going to run this PowerShell script and that's going to change my permissions so that I don't have to worry about any, you know, you know, now I'm a super user, you know, or now I'm a, you know, now I'm better than just a regular user. Could you use protected users group in that case? So, so protected users group is, is awesome. And, um, and that actually pairs well with pause too. Because what the users group does is when you, when you're a member of protected user group, um, it basically forces Kerberos, um, authentication. Um, so you're no longer, um, using NTLM and you're not, you're not leaving your credentials on that box anymore. Um, and it also increases the encryption level of Kerberos, I believe. Um, and, uh, but the, but the, an issue with, with the protected users group is no more, no more cache credentials. So if, if you try to put my laptop on the protected users group, and I go home and I'm not on the domain, I can't log in unless I'm, I'm you know, so I have like a always on VPN or something like that. So um, you got to kind of keep that in mind that protected user group is great, especially for um, not leaving creds around. Now you're still going to leave your Kerberos token ticket around. And when you're in the protected user group, um, it drops the lifetime of that ticket down to, I think, two hours instead of, I don't remember what the default is, but it's quite a bit more than that. So it's doing a lot of good things, but um, in my mind, it's not so much one or the other, but they both really go well together, I guess. That's very cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Vetcher, do you have any other questions? What does uh, make LSA a protected process? Make LSA the uh, or, sorry, LSA. process that Mimi Cat's dumps out of. I think it's LSAS. Yeah, LSAS. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you can make that a protected process by a registry edit. Um, that's just kind of another cool thing that people should do. Um, I think that can break things though i think so you'd have to test it but it can also be reversed by the bad guy and i, I think you might have to reboot i'm not totally sure i think that that might not be totally accurate but um it can be it can be reversed by the bad guy you know just if they have admin rights they can just undo the registry edit and i'm not sure if you have to reboot or not but um it's just kind of another thing you can do to um try to lock that down a little bit more. So I have a, I have a question. So I'm going to go back up to one of your other points here. You, you mentioned configuring WSS for your PAWs. Um, does that mean for each tier you have to have a WSS server because you can't push uh, patches to different tiers? Or do you put your WSS server in your tier zero and everything kind of trickles down from that? Yeah, so that, that, that's an interesting point. Um, you would, you would, you could still have your WSS server. You wouldn't have to have multiple ones. Um, I suppose uh, there could be an argument made for that, though, because if obviously, if your um, WSS um, server is compromised uh, and it could somehow push push something malicious down, that wouldn't be good. But um, yeah, uh, basically, your pod is going to have to talk to that server anyway. To manage it, so um, you just want to make sure uh, in that in that outline there, you, you want to make sure that your pod is getting patched. Some um, that's one way that's going to keep it hardened. Yeah. But you really want to limit anything you install on that, you know. So sure. You know, the the less you install on there, the better. I I don't I wouldn't I don't even know if I would put like uh, enterprise antivirus on it like. Uh, because, you know, you see like Tavis or Mandy on Twitter always coming up with, with that semantic one not too long ago where mm -hmm. all you had to do is send somebody an email and it runs the kernel so the engine uh, just scanning the file uh, pops your box. So I think you're almost better 
relying on Windows Defender. Windows Defender on Windows 10 is actually pretty tough to, um, uh, it's just getting better and better. The only thing it, in my eyes that isn't great is the, like, the reporting of it. But if you have that hooked up to like a SIM or uh, it's things like that, um, I th in my opinion is it's pretty good. Yeah, so I mean, if you're you, you mentioned uh, Windows 10 Hyper-V, so I'm assuming you've deployed Windows 10 to to all the environments uh, or all your people. So you're running you're running fairly recent versions of Windows. Could could you use like uh, snapshotting, the snapshotting abilities of you know using VMs and such, so that once somebody's done actually doing something on that host and they shut down the VM, it automatically revert back to an earlier snapshot that is a known good, so that um, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about, okay, you know, they're running on this box five minutes ago, they did something and picked up a virus. The minute they shut it off, it would revert back to a snapshot, which wouldn't have that virus in the first place. Is that something that could be um, used uh, to, you know, further secure the system? Yeah, I suppose it would be, you know, I think you really would have an advantage with that if you're running a VDI or something like that, um, where you could actually just do that on a regular basis, you know, you'd have to have a, have it really set up right so that you're not blowing away anything that the user's using. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every night you could just go back to a known good, I would think. That's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the, the only other negative I see about this is if you have, a, you know, if you're a Mac shop or if you're a window or a Linux shop, then, you know, you're, you're pretty much hamstrung by, this right i mean can't really use those in this environment right i mean i guess you could use them as vms but i mean does the does the tiered situation work for for those environments or those uh those os's um not the way i have it set up but um i would think you could develop your own paw uh that's linux based you know whatever your your next flavor is mm -hmm. um you just would have to come up with the criteria of that on your own and um you know you can you know what you can basically remove everything i mean linux if you if you got a linux guru and guru in the house you can really take everything out of that distro that you want and and uh i, I would think that you could definitely do it um you just have to you know set up your criteria and um how much what what you're going to be using it for, and um, and the risk you want to take by what what you want to have installed on it, and you know mm -hmm. you can do the same thing as with um, IP tables and stuff for allowing you know blocking everything inbound and um, not allowing um, browsing from it, and uh, I'm sure you can configure all that uh, with Unix or Linux, but uh, it just take work probably to set that up. Yeah, you could probably use something like SE Linux to help push policies uh, yeah. uh, to to harden the uh, the system or uh, what App Armor. There's you know GRSec. You know, there's a ton of stuff out there that you could you know push out to to harden your your workstations on that. Yeah. Yeah. How, no, how, you know, how does I don't, I don't think uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do that with a different uh, the whole the concept would be the same. Yeah. How would how would Paul work with uh, alternative meta methods of authentication? Like if you wanted to use smart cards or, uh, you know, Windows 10 with the anniversary edition has that facial recognition thing. Do you just not allow those kinds of uh, things and go with a straight password or would, uh, would a smart card still be available? Well, actually, uh, in that article, they talk about different phases of deploying this. And at first they talk about just, just deploying it for domain admins. Mm-hmm. And then as you kind of get acclimated it and stuff to it, you deploy it to all uh, like member servers and all administrators. Mm -hmm. And part of that too is rep they recommend um, using smart cards as well. So I haven't got that that far into it yet. Um, I know there are some unique things with smart cards as far as leaving creds uh, around, like. Uh, I think that it doesn't change your, your, it's something to do with like the Kerberos ticket or, or is it Intel? I don't remember if it's Kerberos or the hash that's, that doesn't get changed unless you 
do some scripting magic to make it change uh, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So okay. I, I, I guess I haven't researched that enough to know. For well, that's okay. That was a fringe question anyway. I, I have not seen any company or organization using smart cards since I left uh, government service back in 2006. So I know a lot of hospitals like to try to use them, but they end up staying logged in on a bunch of the servers anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I would like to, to, you know, see those become more ubiquitous because, I mean, it's something you have instead of something you know. You know, it's a different method of you know, authentication. So, um, Mr. Betcher, do you have any other questions before we, uh, you know, end, end the podcast for this week? No, just a, a comment. I agree. Windows Defender has come a long way. Um, I was reading an article the other day where um, it, it can deobfuscate, right, um, malware, and mm -hmm. then read the signature from that and not just have to you know, um, read the obfuscated portion of it and think, well, this seems okay. Right. So, so yeah. And, and other antivirus can take advantage of that because it is part of windows. Windows defender just has it by default now. Very cool. So yeah, yeah. just, just a note on that. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not a red team guy, so I don't, uh, I'm by no means a, an expert, but I was just trying to run, um, invoke Mimi cats, with PowerShell on Windows 10, and um, and in the PowerShell window, it was giving me an error saying this script contains malicious whatever. So I was googling about it, and they said, "Well, just change change the script. Change uh, it's as simple as changing the Mimi cats in the script to something else." And I tried that, and uh, couldn't get that to work. Now I'm sure there's a way around it, but I mean they they're really trying to. Um, and I think they're doing a really good job, really in giving us tools to um, combat these things. And you got to give a lot of props to some of the guys out there that are helping them do that, you know, like uh, obscure, obscure sec and um, passing the hash. And I mean, they put a lot of pressure on Microsoft to give us tools to mitigate this stuff. So. Yeah. And you can't just change the signature of the, of Mimi cats either. That doesn't work. It uh, looks in some of the internal sections of the binaries to, to figure out what it is. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, William, uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Uh, you know, I was going to say, I'm sorry your talk was rejected, and I'm glad you were able to come on the show. But, um, you know, congratulations on having your talk accepted at uh, DerbyCon. We're going to see you at DerbyCon. We're going to sit down and have a, a beverage or one or two and mm -hmm. uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, Mr. Betcher, apparently you met Mr. Betcher uh, at DerbyCon last year, uh, he thinks. Um, do you, did he look familiar to you before we turn the webcams off? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, he did. I think I talked to him. I talked to you there uh, and Michael Goff. By the um, after yeah. one of you, after one of you guys' talks, we were talking about um, logging. near the bar, huh? Near the couch. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Nice, small world. Very nice. Okay, <laughs> very cool. Um, so, I mean, with that, with that in, uh, in mind, uh, you're at DerbyCon. How would people get a hold of you to maybe? We we didn't go through everything in your talk because we wanted to keep some surprises. Uh, I, I hope, and I'm sure that this is just. Uh, you're now working hard on the slides for the talk. So I'm sure there's going to be other things in the talk. So it would definitely behoove people if they're wanting a different way of locking down the, the systems to, uh, to, to, to look into this. So how would they get a hold of you if they wanted to maybe add more input or if they wanted to go, yeah. Hey, you know, ask some more questions, how would they do so? You no, know, I'd love to get some feedback um, from any positive or negative feedback from people before my talk. Um, it's just going to help me make it better, I think. So it's kind of nice talking this over with you guys um, before I really get the into the details. And um, um, I'm actually getting kind of nervous because I don't feel like I have a whole lot of time to get that done. But uh, yeah, uh, Twitter, um, if you just want to reach out to me on Twitter, it's at Blue Teamer. At Blue Teamer, okay. Yep. All right. Are you are you on LinkedIn or the you know anywhere else that you'd like to to mention? Tumblr. You have a you know, you have a Tinder. No, wait, you don't have a Tinder. No, no, no. Um, no, no, no LinkedIn. Uh, okay. You know, I'm one of those paranoid, paranoid people. 
Right on. And you're, you said you're in South Dakota. So if there's any InfoSec people in South Dakota, you know, they could uh, reach out to a South Dakota in there and maybe you guys can get together and, uh, you know, do a meetup or something. That might be fun. That's right. Dakota con. Dakota con. When's that? Are you speaking of that? Uh, that's in, um, it's in the spring. I can't, I'm not sure if it's May or April. It's, okay. It's actually pretty getting, it's getting pretty good. Very nice. Okay. All right. Um, so, Mr. Butcher, uh, same question. How would people get a hold of you if they wanted to discuss, uh, you know, what what you're doing? Because uh, you guys are going to be – are you going to be – you're going to be speaking at DerbyCon, but on uh, LogMD, right? Or is that just Mr. Goff? That's just Mr. Goff. He's, Great. Uh, he, he got accepted for uh, uh, for a talk, so okay. we'll see how that goes. Very cool. I mean, uh, Yep, he's got to he's got to get that all prepared now. It's a new it's a new thing. So ah, all right, he's talking about something he hasn't talked before talked about before. So ooh, and treaded waters. Yep. Okay, well, how would people get a hold if they wanted to? I'm on Twitter. Just uh, hit me up there at Betterpound. B o e t t c h e r p w n e d. Very nice. Okay. Um, the BreakSec podcast, uh, you can follow the official one at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Uh, you can follow me uh, on uh, Twitter. I'm at Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. <clears throat> um, you know, we're, we're pretty much everywhere on the internet. We have a SoundCloud page where we post our podcasts. Uh, we have a, a Facebook page, has about 13,000 people. I don't know. I, I don't have 13,000 downloads for podcasts uh, except in a month. So some of those people are probably uh, following us for, you know, just be bandwagon fans. Uh, you know, we're on Player FM. We're on uh, Stitcher. If you're a fan of TuneIn Radio Network, we, we're on there. Uh, of course, we're on iTunes and we have a YouTube channel where um, you can listen to us on, on YouTube if you don't want to use a RSS feed or RSS reader. Um, you know, we have a Patreon, you know, I appreciate all the people that have been given money to, uh, support us on Patreon. Um, some of you folks from the very beginning, like Miss Sunny and, uh, and some guy named Leroy Jenkins. I don't know who that guy is. Um, that's Mr. Betcher, by the way. Um, and you know, all those people, uh, you know, they find value in what we, we put out here every week. And, you know, we've done a podcast every week for over two and a half years, which is, got to be some kind of record. So, uh, if you, you know, you find any kind of value in this, you know, you can support us for as little as a dollar, you know, um, we've had a couple people support us at $20 recently and they're uh, being entered into our uh, drawing, which, uh, by the time this podcast comes out, we're actually drawing it, uh, tomorrow. Today's the 19th. We're going to draw it on the 20th. So congratulations to whoever won. I'm sure uh, you're, you're doing, you're excited about going to Derby con. Um, and hopefully next year we'll we'll do some of the same stuff. We'll do another CTF and we'll do another drawing and a raffle. But I think we've um, we raised almost a thousand dollars for hackers for charity. So that's that's pretty awesome. Um, well, that is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we we did almost a thousand dollars worth of business for them. We did like six hundred and fifty last year. I think we did almost a thousand this year. So um, yeah, if um, you know, we, we didn't we do hope- anything. It was all. Well, all yeah, you guys, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, folks who are wanting to to get involved with DerbyCon and get a you know entry to win, they just had to get fifty. Every fifty bucks they gave to Hackers for Charity was uh, was an entry to win. So we had one guy give like three hundred and fifty bucks, and I was like, you know, I told the guy, I was like, yeah, you know, his name's Trevor. I was like, you know, um, you it's only one hundred seventy five bucks, and there are tickets floating out there. You could have just done that. He's like, no, 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 it's cool. I give to them on a regular basis anyway. I was like, all right, whatever. So he's uh, he's the overwhelming he has the overwhelming odds right now trevor does but we're gonna i'm gonna take a video and we're gonna randomize the list and we're gonna pull out a random number and you know even guy with one entry can still win the win this whole whole shebang so um yeah we're gonna be drawing that on the 20th of august so congratulations to everyone so um bill thank you uh, for coming on the show um you know i'm glad uh, it turned out for the best for you uh you know and you know, I guess I should mention if you've got a rejected talk uh, that was rejected at one of the major cons, or you know, uh, you you just maybe want to test it out at our podcast before you send it out. You know, hit us up uh, bds.podcast at gmail.com. All right. So uh, that was it for this week's podcast. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Betcher, for recording. This podcast almost never didn't happen, so I uh, appreciate you uh, stepping up there and, uh, and doing that. It's our DR plan. <laughs> yeah, we definitely implemented the DR plan today, boy. Oh, my God. All right, so um, that was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Uh, have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. You know how B sides got started, Brian? You're, uh, <laughs> you're, oh, uh, yeah. B sides was like all the rejected talks from Black Hat and Def Con, right? Yeah. And now there's a rejected con. I saw that after I put the re- the hashtag rejected talks up. Some yeah. guy was like, hey, yeah, we also take rejected talks too. I was like, oh, great. You know, there's no <laughs> official, you know, there's no original idea out there, but, you know, I, there are still people who were rejected from the rejected cons talk you know, or, yeah. or from B side. So, I mean, there are still talks that don't make the grade. And right. I mean, you know, talks like bill were on the cusp, you know, or, you know, you've got people who've never talked before and they're a little you know, weirded out about doing so. So, you know, I mean, the whole idea of the rejected talks was, you know, the, the hashtag was to, you know, 2000 people are going to see this podcast or hear this podcast. I mean, that's, that's more than what you're going to get at a stable talk at DerbyCon. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. even, even if they just go to DerbyCon and watch the video later, you're going to get maybe five, 600 people watching the whole thing. This has 2000 people averaging listening to this podcast. And that's in perpetuity. I mean, we still have podcasts that are year and a half, two years old that have over 4,000 downloads. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, and this is a nice way of getting people's name out there. You're like, hey, you know, not only did I talk at B-Sides, I also was on Breaking Down Security Podcast. So, you know, you can add that to your resume. You can add that to your LinkedIn profile. I mean, you can use that as a, I don't want to say a brag, you know, part of your brag sheet. But, I mean, you're giving back to the industry in some meaningful way.